All right, if everyone's ready, I'm gonna let everyone in. You're going to want to be, and you meet with clients, you'd rather be in it. All right, everyone's in. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Karen Goodfellow. I'm the director of the Boston Art Commission. I'm the director of public art and the mayor's office of arts and culture. Um, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the June 8th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. I'd like to remind you that this meeting is being recorded and to update your name, pronouns, and to please keep yourself muted so that we can hear people speak. Um, I believe closed captioning is available today. Um, and you can access it at the bottom of your screen. If you have trouble locating the controls or it doesn't seem to be working, please let um, us know um, by chatting us. The Boston Art Commission staffed by the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture is an independent board composed of two ex officio and seven appointed volunteer and art design professionals that holds public meetings to review and vote on matters concerning the city's art collection. Meetings are generally held the second Tuesday of each month to review current public art projects cited on or, or proposed for City of Boston property. We'll, we will be engaged in discussion of public art in Boston in order to foster the creation and collection of artworks that reflect the people, ideas, histories, and futures of Boston, which is the traditional homeland of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the continuing presence of the Massachusetts as well as the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples. We also recognize the indigenous peoples represented in the city's residents in addition to those in the diaspora. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually. To ensure public access to the deliberations of the Boston Art Commission, the public may access this meeting through telephone and video conferencing. I'm joined by the Boston Art Commission staff working within the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture, Sarah Rodrigo, Public Art Project Manager and Trisha Gilrain, Collections Manager, who will be helping to facilitate this meeting. And Trisha will add our contact information to the chat. And I'll now hand it over to Chair Mark Pasnick and Vice Chair Igwa Holmes, who will call the meeting to order and go over some further instructions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and welcome to everybody. I'm calling this public hearing to order at 4.05 p.m. Today, the Boston Art Commission will be holding its monthly public meeting. I'll now take the roll call of commissioners to confirm a quorum. After I state your name, commissioners, please say here. Uh, let me see. Uh, Aqua Holmes. Here. Camilo Alvarez. Here. John Andrus. Here. Michael Canizzo. Here. Uh, the next slide. Bob Freeman. Here. Brian Hone. Here. And Kim Pinder. Here. Great. So we have a quorum. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. We will now review meeting minutes from the previous May 25th meeting of the Boston Art Commission. Are there any comments or modifications any commissioners would like to make at this time? Okay, hearing none, I'm wondering if Kim would like to make a motion to accept the minutes? Yes, I would. I'd <laughs> like to make a motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Do I hear a second? <laughs> Eight close seconds, Pat. Uh, so I will just run through the commissioners again and get your votes. So, uh, Aqua Holmes? Yes. Camilo Alvarez? Yes. John Andres? Yes. Michael Canizzo? Yes. Uh, Bob Freeman? Yes. Brian Hone? Yes. Actually, actually, Bob, I'm not sure I heard you. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Kim Pinder? Yes. Okay, great. So the motion passes. I'm also a yes. Uh, on the next slide, you will see uh, today's agenda. Um, uh, which we will be following today. The agenda for these meetings are always posted posted publicly on boston.gov. We'll begin with the director's report and then move on to presentations for review. At the time of presentations, we will provide you, the public, with information about how you can participate. 
Uh, so next up, Karen's director's report. Karen? Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, we'll go over a few administrative items. Firstly, Sorry. we're really excited. Uh, the transformative public art call to artists for 2021 was recently released. For the last few years, we've commissioned several murals and short-term projects uh, each year as part of this program over the summers. This year, the mayor's office is launching the Joy Agenda, a citywide invitation, opportunity and investment in our collective well-being. Uh, we believe that transformative folk art helps us all make space for joy, reconnection, celebration. The mayor's office of arts and culture and us at the um, Boston Art Commission have invited artists to submit interest and proposals for the development of transformative public artworks with particular interest again in murals in short term and new media art projects. Um, I will say we've been working on expanding our understanding of what public art can be in many of our conversations and, and through this program in particular. In the last year, we've affirmed our belief that public art must take new and different forms. Through this call, we are again seeking relational public art by commissioning artworks that hold space for joy, encourage opportunities for collective processing of grief and invest in healing imagination and play. We understand that finding joy through art includes making room for both celebrating and processing our, our experiences. And we're looking for artworks that respond to COVID-19 and racial and social justice movements and provide creative approaches to public connections and cultural community gatherings. Projects should take into account that people may have different comfort levels about coming together in public spaces and that many of us are simultaneously mourning losses while feeling gratitude. And on the screen, you can see the cover page uh, of this year's call on the left, as well as a few projects we've commissioned in the past on the right. On the next slide, um, you can see some description for the three opportunities that are part of this call. We've had three deadlines. Um, opportunity one is a citywide mural call where artists will have their mural proposal matched with the city wall. This opportunity closed on June 2nd, and we are now going through submissions from artists and beginning to match them with city walls. Uh, budgets will range from twenty-five dollars to $75,000, depending on the site. For opportunity two, artists have been asked to share interest in four unique community murals. The murals are for um, the following four projects. The a mural in Boston's Latin Quarter in Mozart Park in Jamaica Plain, working with Hyde Square Task Force and community members. The legacy of Malcolm X in Malcolm X Park in Roxbury, working with Boston Parks and Recreation Department and community members. The legacy of Rita Hester and Transgender Day of Remembrance in Austin, working with a consulting team. Um, which will be hired um, to lead community engagement and community members. And then uh, the East Boston Senior Center in East Boston, working with Age Strong Boston and community members. This opportunity closes on June 16th and budgets will range from twenty five dollars to $75,000 again, depending on the site. For opportunity three, artists can propose projects that involve traditional and new media um, that speak to Boston spaces, relationships at this uh, unique moment in time. And this is the most flexible opportunity and is the most like the call we released last year. And we're asking for budgets starting at $1,000, but they could um, certainly be larger. But we wanna make room for um, folks who are just entering public art or who might um, wanna try something new. And propos proposals may include, but aren't limited to new media, including web-based projects, online comics, virtual reality, and then more traditional media, including murals, short-term sculpture, installations, performances, community-engaged cultural practices, and other social practices, including events related to joy and grief and other um, experiences that we've all been having. And we're particularly interested in projects that engage youth and reach uh, non-English speaking communities. And we're asking artists to share their proposals with sites already identified. And that opportunity closes on June 30th. And we will share a couple links in the chat. And we'd really appreciate if anyone here today would be willing to share that, um, share that out with artists and cultural organizers that they know. Two weeks ago on May 25th, we held our first special meeting of the BAC specifically to listen to public testimony regarding indigenous public art and cultural spaces in Boston. This meeting was responsive to community requests that were made during public meetings on the re-examination of the city's public art collection last summer, as well as suggested as next steps identified in an opportunity for change, the preliminary report we commissioned in 2018 on the national dialogue surrounding monuments and uh, their relevance to Boston's public art collection. And more recently, the panel series Confronting Colonial Myths in Boston's Public Spaces by Artists in Residence, Erin Genia. 
the commission listened to testimony from 12 uh, Native American and Indigenous community members, um, and we will share a link out of the recording if you missed that. Um, and you can also learn more about Erin Genia's residency work with Boston Artists in Residence Program, um, and that's on the slide, um, and we'll also put that in the chat. And um, with that, I will hand it over to our attorney, Nyla Freeman, who will provide some legal updates. And I think there'll be um, record uh, regarding the previous open meeting law complaints addressed at the AC meetings um, on April 29th and May 11th. Is Nyla with us? Can you guys see and hear me? Yeah, thank you. Yep. That is great because I cannot see anyone. All right, but this is all that matters right now. Yeah. So good afternoon. Um, and yes, Karen, I'm gonna provide a very brief update, but also just a quick, I'm gonna quickly reiterate the process for just open meeting law complaints, because I think part of this uh, update includes letting you guys know where we are in the process and what to expect next. So as you all are aware, we received an open meeting, well, two open meeting law complaints in May, April and May from Mr. Christopher Milady. And in processing the open media law complaints, we have um, we have a certain amount of business days to respond back. So for this most recent one, we received it on May 3rd and we responded by May 21st within a lot of time. The way that works is, you know, under the open media law, we're required to respond. And part of that response is just, uh, you know, determining whether or not there's any remedial action that needs to be taken and working that out with the complainant before the attorney general's office is involved. A complainant has 30 days from the date on which they file a complaint to request further review by the attorney general. So for our May 3rd complaint, which we again responded to by May 21st, the period in which the complainant can then elect to have a further review process will run by July 8th. That's where we are in that process. In terms of how the, the complaint's been resolved, it's still an ongoing conversation. What we did and what I did on my part is we submitted a response where, and if you guys haven't received a copy of it, and Karen, I'm not, I, I know you have a copy of it. I'm not sure if it's been circulated, but if you haven't received a copy of it, I will um, forward it to Karen again. But essentially, there are some steps that we agree to just make sure that we're always complying and ins ensuring we're always in compliance with open meeting law, which part of that's gonna involve a training, uh, well, another training on open meeting law. And I think um, Karen and Trisha will talk to you guys more about dates for that and the plan around that. But we do make that representation because that's you know part of this conversation. And I think the, the last two conversations with this particular complaint and is making sure that we're all on the same page about the requirements for the open meeting law. And I, I think this last complaint was a, a really good opportunity for us to all refresh ourselves on just how or how the, the, the attorney general's office and how the, the statute views open meetings and you know what's required for open meetings, what, you know, how we conduct ourselves outside of open meetings. So that that training and I think the training and also the dissemination of the any type of communications related to, I believe for this particular complaint, it was the emanci uh, emancipation group. We've responded, we've provided um, with the help of our, with the help of our public records officer, we've provided the complainant with copies of communications and data or information around the emancipation, uh, emancipation group. So I think right now where we are is continuing the conversation with the complainant because I received another, another email with just clarifying questions. I'll be responding to that email. Um, I'll be responding to that email and we'll provide you guys another copy of this further response. But the complainant at this point is within their right to, um, to elect for further review. But I believe the plan and I, I think Karen and the staff were all on the same page is to continue these conversations to make sure that, you know, where we can actually resolve and take appropriate remedial action, we're doing it. 
And that's all I have for you. Thanks, Nyla. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nyla. Uh, at the March 9th meeting, um, as you remember, we voted to approve the final design for the embrace, or you voted to improve the embrace um, as presented by King Boston, pending that the MOU and its exhibits as currently drafted uh, are accepted and that um, they'd come back if there are any substantial changes. Um, just an update is we're still working on that. I'm meeting with um, Corporation Council tomorrow on this, but um, very good news is that the uh, King Boston and um, the full memorial went before landmarks um, on the 25th, the same day that we had our special meeting and it was unanimously approved. And that's just a, a huge win for this project. Um, and while we're still straightening out some of the paperwork and in details that we have made, um, we've seen huge progress and um, are really thrilled to be able to share that with you, that the race will be moving forward. Okay, and now um, we're going to share, review some in-process public art projects, which include both short-term and long-term projects. We have three short-term projects to report, graffiti walls in Alston, proposed by Alston Village Main Streets, a series of collaborative murals in Grove Hall, proposed by Now and There, and the Greater Grove Hall Main Streets, and a tactical plaza in East Boston, proposed by the Boston Transportation Department, and uh, Redgate Real Estate. Um, we're really excited to share all of these and we've reviewed them administratively and think um, they, they look really good, but we want to share them publicly and get input from you. If you are a proponent or an artist for one of these projects and would like to speak, please chat staff and the chair, vice chair, um, or we may call on you to speak when it's your turn. Um, but you, you don't need to present at this time and we'll be sharing these on your on your behalf. If you wish to offer comment or voice support, also please chat with staff and we can either share your comments publicly or let the chair and vice chair know. And as a reminder, all these presentations have been included in your commissioner folders for reference. Uh, the first project we are reporting on is the Austin Graffiti Wall proposed by Austin Village Main Streets. This wall will be similar to the wall in Central Square in Cambridge, which has a graffiti alley, creating a space uh, for artists to, um, to paint at um, different times. It is a rotating work. If you haven't been there, it's very popular by Central Kitchen. Um, this proposed project addresses two key issues, graffiti on public and private services in Alston that many see as detrimental to the vibrancy of the business district and allocating space for public art in a neighborhood full of talented artists. This wall is an opportunity to celebrate the cultural culture of independent art that is so ingrained in Alston, utilize a corner of the neighborhood overrun with simple tags and and refocus the core of graffiti, moving it from storefronts and public fixtures onto uh, one centralized location. That is their proposal. On the top left, you can see the wall and its location within the municipal lot. The lot is off Harvard Ave, adjacent to and behind a number of local businesses on Harvard Ave and Brighton, Harvard and Brighton Aves. A map in the lower left-hand corner um, shows the parking lot location. And on the right, you can see various examples of graffiti from around Alston, which is home to numerous artists and is the only neighborhood in the city named after an artist. By looking at Central Square's graffiti alley, images of which are shown here, Alston Village Main Streets also sees an opportunity to create a destination for tourists, shoppers, and residents. The Alston Wall in question belongs to the city of Boston and is run by uh, the Transportation Department, who are supportive of this project. Alston Village Main Streets would like to grant artists all around the city access to paint this wall freely, providing them a public space to showcase their work. Alston Village Main Streets envisions a grand opening event at this wall with music, food, and local invited graffiti artists painting the wall to kick the project off. In addition um, to BTD, the project has support from Councillor Braden, the Alston Board of Trade, and many surrounding businesses, including Ritual Arts, Regeneration Tattoo, and Froyo World. I wanted to mention that we may have someone from Councilor Braden's office here to speak in support. Um, and if anyone is here to share support, please do chat us. And if not, then I will, I will move on, but we feel very supportive of this project. And if anyone has any questions, 
um, please let us know. It looks like we don't have any chats. So we will move to the next. The next proposal we have to report is mentoring murals, which will present, oh wait, somebody. Uh, we do have somebody from um, the counselor's office, um, Pam Mullaney. Hi, um, I won't take very long. I really appreciate the opportunity on behalf of Councilor Braden. I'm her chief of staff. Um, big shout out to Alex Cornicini, to the Boston Transportation Department Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture. We are really excited about this project. That's all I want to say. Thanks. Thanks, Pam. Okay. The, the next project, um, we have is uh, mentoring murals, which will present six artworks between June 2021 and 22 um, by celebrated Boston artists through a series of temporary printed murals. Each mural will showcase one mentor and one mentee's work. The project builds on the importance of mentorship and maintaining a vibrant black arts community by inviting three artists from the famed Boston Collective to ask a younger artist to create side-by-side -side imagery on a highly visible wall in the neighborhood. By creating a dynamic set of changing imagery, the project aims to amplify the Black mural movement's past and presence in Boston, extend its power to a new generation of Boston residents, and support equitable economic investments in Greater Grove Hall. This project has been proposed by Now and There, who is partnering with Grove Hall Main Streets. The murals will be installed from June 2021 to March 2022. Each pair of artists will have their work up for three months starting on June 15, 2021, with the final pairing of artists having their work deinstalled on March 14, 2022. The murals will be installed along the vacant wall of Breeze's Laundromat, 345 Blue Hill Ave in Grove Hall, Dorchester. Each mural will be printed on a vinyl mesh fabric attached to a metal frame with discrete bungee cords to allow for wind movement and uh, to simplify the installation and deinstallation. Lead artists for the project are Paul Goodnight, Larry Pierce, and Aqua Holmes. Uh, the partner artists are pending, but some possible artists are shown at the bottom of this slide. And on this slide is the final image of the first mural by Paul Goodnight and Larry Pierce. And I, I know we have um, folks from now and there um, who are in attendance. And I don't know if there's anyone else who wanted to say anything, but please chat and let us know. If not, that's okay too. Uh, the, the install is actually June 16th. Sorry about that. Hey, Leah, would you like to add something? Hi, yes, I don't know if you guys can see me. Um, I just want to thank the commission. I'm Leah Triple Harrington. I'm the curator here at Now and There. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for reviewing our application and also invite you to our June 16th opening. It's a week from tomorrow. Um, we'll have music. Um, Mayor Janie is gonna be in attendance. We'd love to see you all as well, from 5 to 7 p.m. So thank you, thank you so much. Okay, and uh, the last project that we're uh, sharing tonight, um, you can see here. Uh, the City of Boston Transportation Department in partnership with Redgate Real Estate, the BPDA and the Oriental Heights Neighborhood Council is proposing a street mural by local artist Felipe Ortiz as part of a new tactical plaza in East Boston as part of the BTD's tactical public realm program. This is an image of the design featuring water birds and a graphic motif. The mural will be in a new pedestrian area as delineated by lane markings and flex posts per traffic plans approved by the Boston Transportation Department. There is plans to use Bear Premium Plus, exterior satin enamel and Benjamin Moore um, latex traffic paint. You can find more technical information about the mural and plaza in your folders if anyone has questions. Would, um, Anyone from BTD or, or any of the other partnering organizations 
like to speak? Well, Jacob Wessel from the Boston Transportation Department. I think uh, that about covered it. Uh, this is a, a space that was sort of, um, or, you know, excessive uh, asphalt on the roadway. And so uh, it's great to see this artwork uh, come in the newly set aside uh, area in Orient Heights at Ashley Street and Boardman Street. Thanks. Thanks, Jacob. All right. So now we'll just very quickly go over our long-term uh, projects and then we'll we'll get to um, the presentations for today. So just to keep you updated, um, the JPBPL Curtis Hall BCYF project installation will be completed this month. Um, though the site remediation, the growing of the grass will take a bit longer. Um, and Joe Wardwell will be installing his artwork over the summer and we're looking forward to Monica Bravo's installation at the East Boston Police Station this fall. Um, structural support, work for that piece is happening this month. So lots of projects going forward. Um, three other projects are currently in final design phase. Tonight, the artists for our high square will be presenting their, um, in, a, in an advisor capacity, their design for uh, high square uh, since it's been a while since this commission um, last saw their proposal and there've been significant and exciting changes there. And we're really looking forward to a dialogue around that project. Um, and we expect to see both both Boston Arts Academy projects for final design review in July. Our other presentation tonight is a preliminary, preliminary design for the DeWitt Playground at Madison Park Athletic Complex by the play team, Marlon Forrester and Studio Luce. Um, also pleased to report that the contract with Jeremy Sobek Harrison for the entrance to the Roxbury branch has been executed and he's beginning his design process, including community engagement. Other contracts are moving along, both Jenny Sabin, the artist for the Ruggles Corridor, and Ricardo Dean Five Gomez, the artist for the Roxbury Branch exterior site, have signed their contracts, and we look forward to getting down to work on, on those projects in the next month or so once the contracts are executed. The Adams Street Branch Artist Review Committee is having its first meeting this Friday, and we look forward to presenting the committee's recommendations to you in July. We also want to announce that the Mayor's Office of Arts and Culture uh, released um, the citywide call to artists for the transformative public art, which we just spoke about. Um, and you can um, view it, it we'll put in again in a link in the chat. And with that, um, we'll, I'll pass back to Mark Nikwa. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Karen. That's a, a full palette of really wonderful things. So uh, it's great to see so much moving forward in June this year. Uh, we will now move on to items on the agenda for review, public testimony, and commission vote. You will notice at the bottom of the screen there are instructions for public testimony, which we will review now, uh, or you will see it on this screen, in fact. Um, here is how you can participate uh, in today's meetings. During the meeting, please keep yourself muted. If you have technical difficulties during the meeting, you can ask questions in the chat and a member of staff will help you. After presentations and commissioners clarifying questions, uh, AQA or I uh, may invite public testimony. If you'd like to participate, you can press and raise uh, and raise the excuse me. You can press the raise your hand icon, and staff will put you in a digital line for comment. You can also let staff know that you have a question in the chat. If you are calling in by phone, press star nine to raise your hand. Please remember to keep your comments on topic and brief. Aqua? Sorry about that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm looking forward to the presentations this afternoon and some lively discussion. Our goal is to make this meeting a great experience for everyone so that all community members will feel comfortable about sharing their feedback and questions. So please be mindful of and respectful of other people's time when speaking so that all participants can feel comfortable adding their comments. If you need to, you can submit longer written testimony to BAC at boston.gov. While you may disagree with other attendees' testimony, please do not interrupt them during their allotted time and keep questions and comments project specific. If you are called on, please state your name, title, program, and organization if that's applicable. And um, we also just ask that we be kind to one another during these comments. Uh, we're, we're all works in progress. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts. Oh, um, yeah, back to you, Karen. Yeah, so we just have a few, a uh, couple presentations for review today and untitled, yet untitled work um, that's here for prelim preliminary design, 
the DeWitt Playground for the DeWitt Playground at Madison Athletic in Roxbury with artists um, from the play team, Marlon Forster and Studio Loose. And the proponent for that project is the city of Boston. And that is part of our, our Percent for Art program. And the second one will be Deep Story, Deep Time Stories of Jamaica Plain. And that is here for an advisory review on final design. Um, and that's in Hyde Square, Jamaica Plain with artists Christina Perino Alonso and Amin Taj. And the proponent for that is also the city of Boston. And with that, I will pass um, back to you. Okay, so our first project for review is a preliminary design proposal for a long-term public art at the DeWitt Playground at Madison Park Athletic Complex in Roxbury. I wanna welcome the play team of Marlon Forrester and Studio Luz. Uh, right now, Sarah Rodrigo, our public art project manager, is gonna give us a brief background and introduce the artist team. Thank Sarah? you so much, Commissioner Holmes. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Um, so very briefly, you can see on this screen, the on the right, the previous iteration of the DeWitt Playground at Madison Park Athletic Complex, um, the design for the renovation, which was a capital project initiated by the Boston Parks and Recreation Department. Um, the site is actually owned by BPS, and there's a lot of partners involved in this project. Um, the project is in Roxbury. Uh, you can see Tremont Street is along the top line and the map on top. Um, this was an extensive renovation to the park to create a more functional space that can be used by all ages. Um, there was a lot of community engagement, both through the parks department and now through the artist team. Um, and they'll speak about that much better than I can. So without further ado, um, I'm really excited for you all to hear from them. And so I'm going to introduce them. The play team, and they're gonna share that acronym because I forgot to write it down again. I'm so sorry, y'all. Uh, is comprised of Marlon Forrester and Studio Luz Architects. Marlon Forrester was born in Guyana, South America. He's an artist and educator raised in Boston. He's a graduate of the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, BA 2008, and Yale School of Art, and MFA in 2010. He served as adjunct professor at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. He's a resident artist at African American Masters Artist Residency Program, AAMARP, adjunct to the Department of African American Studies in association with Northeastern University. He's shown both internationally and nationally. Forrester's work is concerned with the corporate use of the black body or the body as logo. His paintings, drawings, sculptures, and multimedia works reflect meditations on the black figure in America. Studio Luz Architects is an agile forward-thinking practice. They strive to integrate social responsibility and sustainable practices with built architectural expression. The firm was founded by architects Hansi Better Barraza and Anthony Piermarini in 2002. It's based in Boston. Together with project manager Jason Jang, their projects and practice have been widely recognized. They've received international honors, including the Architectural Record Design Vanguard Award, Architectural League of New York Young Architects Award, a Progressive Architecture Award for Boston's Di Design Biennial. I'm mispronouncing things, I apologize everyone. Multiple AIA Design Excellence Awards and the Chicago Athenaeum's American Architecture Award. So I'm gonna hand it off to Marlon and the Studio Luz team. Thank you all for being here. Um, Sarah, I wanna thank you for an amazing introduction. Um, I also wanna thank uh, the BAC uh, Committee and Commission for, um, for allowing us to present today. Um, I wanna to introduce you to uh, my partner in crime uh, in, on this project too as well is Hansi. Hansi? Hi. Thank you so much for having us. I'm Hansi Betabaraz. I'm one of the principals at Studio Luz, and we're so excited to be presenting to all of you. And, I would like uh, to also introduce Jason. <laughs> Jason Yang, he's also the project manager at Studio Luz, um, helping us navigate the process. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to just follow up quickly on the acronyms, which is PLAY means PLAY Lead Athletic, no, PLAY Learn Athletic Youth. So um, and those acronyms really are a part of the foundation of what we're creating, right? Which is a space that allows uh, young people to also uh, engage with images, uh, objects that allow them to learn and um, to understand the history of their region and their area. 
So um, as the lead artist, uh, you know, this has truly been a, a humbling opportunity for me. And um, what we want to start off with is an initial video that we constructed um, that helped to kind of like uh, as a synthesis, a way of like bringing together the overall ideas around the history, dynamic history of the area, as well as uh, the young people that we see as the future generation and use this space in an active way. What's interesting of, as the video is being pulled up is that we were challenged by the Boston Art Commission to think out of the box in, the in ways in which we can communicate to the youth at the site. So um, Marlon led this amazing video to communicate those ideas. Thank you so much, yes. Excellent, excellent. So uh, as we transition, uh, once again, you know, uh, this is the DeWitt Playground Public Art Project. And um, if we can move to the next slide, we can kind of jump right in, which everyone knows. All right, so here are some components in terms of the project vision, right? It was to think about the idea. We had a couple of different ideas that we're jungling at the same time. One was the idea of play, history, uh, uh, wellness, uh, intergenerational engagement, as well as environment and interactive spaces. And we saw these uh, objectives as really the foundation for what we created. Uh, can we move to the next? And so one of the things that we started to do was to think about geographic location. Um, and we start to think about how can we link, you know, the history, the cultural history of Lower Roxbury, Upper Roxbury, um, the South End, which is now uh, has transitioned, uh, you know. Um, so how can we link those histories and of the people that have lived there um, into this site and into this space? Uh, Hansi, would you like to say something about the... Uh, about the uh, overall layout? Yeah, I think that it was important for us to identify uh, cultural markers around the city and how we can begin to create a place where individuals can identify to historical figures that have cultivated and made Boston for what it is in terms of its diversity, in terms of its knowledge and thinking. So it's really about having this DeWitt playground be um, a combinations of all of these local sites that you can see in the city. One, one would think of that as like an access point or a node, you know, where um, that level of engagement is there. Next slide. Um, so one of the things uh, that we looked at in terms of the site project was, you know, these three components, the idea of history. And so uh, the idea of the ground as a space to activate. Um, the idea that sculptural forms or three-dimensional forms could be in that space. We initially used my design. Uh, we used our, my design throughout. The idea that uh, the geometry embedded within the court could be re-articulated in a way and used as a, uh, a space for ritual and transformation. Um, and really just looking at it from the perspective of how African culture and African-American culture has fused into this game of basketball and how it uh, leads one to think about ascension and transformation. Um, and as you look at this map, you can see that there are different access points. Um, Hansi, if you would like, you can talk a little bit more about yep. the map. Yep. The so I, th I think what was nice is that our team did a site walkthrough. As you know, uh, the playground has been already implemented by Stantec, the design team. And it was really important that 
the the play ideas and play sculptures kind of play worked along with the existing design that was on the site. And so what we tried to do was to um, create kind of three ideas of intervention to mix two dimensional art forms with three dimensions. So um, we tried to play with the three dimensional sculptures that you see in terms of seating that were located in a particular site to serve um, the events that would occur at on the site, like uh, performance, like if you're going to watch performance in a half court, you would be served by these play three dimensional seating sculptures. Uh, in terms of kind of creating um, a composition within the whole site, we did the two dimensional, I would say, ground interventions, which is, uh, you know, Marlon would get into it, but it was this idea of linking trail of history narratives on the ground as you're walking across the site. And then lastly, we have the two dimensional kind of vertical interventions that plays along with the existing fence um, that has to be there. But you know, how do you take advantage of existing structures and um, embed history into that? And then the other is uh, new kind of vertical surfaces that begin, begin to create silhouettes of historical history uh, historical figures that we want to create in terms of combining the past and the present. And then with that, you know, just the very basics of being an ath athlete and playing basketball and knowing that you need some shade, <laughs> you know, the space uh, itself, you know, which is very open, uh, didn't lead to, to thinking about how can you engage the community, but also how can you take uh, into account the needs of the actual young people using the space, whether it's 90 degrees outside or 80 degrees outside or 70 degrees outside. Um, so we also thought about these three dimensional objects, these shaded canopies, right? Um, and also interactive spaces where, uh, you know, people can walk through and feel as if they are embedded into the into history themselves. So uh, can we please move to the next slide? Excellent, inspiration, inspiration. Um, next, next slide. Uh, so these are the fences, uh, ideas of memory, place sculptures. And these are some of my initial sketches um, in terms of thinking about the space, how to articulate it, how to take these two dimensional forms and turn them into three dimensional, uh, uh, three -dimensional objects. Um, and really moving through uh, the idea of the fence as almost like a tableau or theatrical space, right? And then uh, thinking about the play and seating as, um, as almost um, uh, cubicles or cubes or nodes um, in which people could not only sit in, but also uh, charge up their phone, you know, um, read about history, uh, also um, embed uh, different sensory experiences in terms of like having a haptic kind of feeling um, to the actual sculpture. So if you were blind, for instance, and you could read uh, in Braille um, some of the history of the, um, of the, of the people um, that we've noted and have selected um, to display or incorporate into the experience. Um, and then we have the sidelines once again um, transformed um, using the geometry, and then we have the mural of history, which itself was initially a climbing wall, <laughs> but is now <laughs> transformed into a more safer wall. <laughs> um, and then we have the shaded camp canopies at the very end. Next. So uh, here's the mirror of history, once again, taking the geometric forms and shapes. And um, on the right hand side, uh, I have a, a piece that I created called uh, Exploring Sacred Geometry Through, Through Line. I did that in 2016 at Montserrat College of Art. And so it was a large scale uh, installation um, in which you know, I used tape to transform uh, the wall and the floor and uh, incorporate geometric forms of abstraction as well as some text inside. Um, and using the, the, the literal lines, geometric forms from the court as a framework to work within. Um, and also I allowed uh, others to activate that space with me. So uh, a majority or all of the work is inspired by this um, early iteration or installation piece from 2016. Next. Uh, fences, uh, mirror of history. Uh, we have Reggie Lewis, uh, we have Malcolm X, Elma Lewis, 
uh, Martin Luther King, Mel King, and um, I think another uh, person. Um, it, I think in this uh, in this mirror history, there is also glass embedded into it. Uh, Hansi, do you want to talk a little bit about the mirror of history and, and some of the components? I think you've covered it. I think it was just important for us to kind of adapt to what you typically find in playgrounds, which is this fence. But we wanted to remind the youth that, um, you know, in terms of us, of reflections, you'll see that as a common theme, that reflection is really important to see yourself in these figures. And so that's where you have uh, the, the combination of reflective material and then perforated material. And these are reusing kind of the post structures that it's, that's currently existing. Next. Uh, once, uh, once again, you use thinking about the fence of history and the body uh, and these silhouettes are uh, cutouts are, are perfect opportunities for young people to understand that their capacity is beyond just the mind, right? The physical body doesn't hold you, but uh, they can uh, mimic or walk uh, within the silhouettes of these historical figures. And, and these will be dispersed on the trail of history, right? Um, at the, the um, placed at the very uh, entrance of the of the playground. Next, um, engraved information will be embedded into the silhouettes, uh, as well as once again braille uh, for those you know thinking about the haptic experience. Those who are who cannot see, uh, and a various uh, variety of colors embedded, a concrete base below. And we're really trying to humanize these silhouettes. So we want uh, people to feel as if uh, the average size is six to seven feet, that they can uh, walk in the real footsteps of these people. And so the list goes on from Emma Lewis, Chuck T Turner, rest in peace, Chuck. Okay, uh, I just have to say that very quickly, rest in peace, Chuck, amazing, Harry Tugman, Melina Cass, and so forth. Next. Uh, the sidelines, once again, you know, function as that abstracted space around transformation, um, using the geometry on the court as an embedded linguistic space, but also a space um, that leads to perspective, right? Leads to changing in various perspectives, uh, flattening out the space where people feel like they're walking and having uh, a sense of depth um, that goes beyond what they see. And that's the outer framing around, around the two courts. Um, next. Actually, and then trail of history, uh, we have those pointed in blue. Next. And then uh, the place seating, once again, in, embedded uh, geometric forms taken from the ride from the, uh, that installation, exploring sacred geometry through line. Uh, now there are functional uh, spaces uh, for young people to slide on, to play on, um, and um, use uh, their technology onto as well. Next. Once again, three-dimensional, two-dimensional form, three-dimensional form spaces for young people to also engage with and move through. Uh, we're thinking about, uh, obviously, we'll be focusing on the material, right? And, and what kind of material will allow them to safely move through these objects. Next. So here we have the, once again, the seating uh, uh, um, objects or sculptures. Um, and then we also have in here, I think, uh, we are looking to uh, incorporate charging stations too as well. Uh, I, you know, thinking about parents coming to watch a game and um, needing to be visible, manage, you know, maybe more than one child, and also have their technology being uh, charged at the same time to make it accessible. And so these uh, seated areas are dispersed um, throughout the playground uh, from the courts to, to, to the um, location where uh, that's adjoining the, uh, I think, raised uh, theatrical space. Next. There's another view from uh, above. Next. And here are the shaded canopies. Really, uh, for me, being a basketball player, <laughs> young person, always thinking about, you know, why is it so hot out here? <laughs> and uh, just an opportunity for young people to have some 
uh, space to rest, but also to have an opportunity to uh, be protected from the weather should it start to rain, uh, variable spaces. Those canopies are on both sides of the court. Next. There's two, uh, I think this is the second iteration. Above metal uh, metallic or metal um, structures below um, frame. And I think what we're doing is we're also weaving, creating some kind of uh, uh, fabric or um, cloth or material that will allow light to come through as well as um, prevent a lot of uh, water uh, or rain coming through too as well. Next. And so here are the components, kind of summary of the design, uh, mirrors of history, fence of history, sidelines, trail of history, uh, the place seating as well as place seating that allows for more the digital, um, others with historical components embedded inside and the shaded canopies. Um, Hansi? I think you summarized them all, Marlon. I think I can talk a little bit more about the, um, the community the process. Mm -hmm. yep. All right, so next, Hansi? Yep, so um, as I mentioned, we were, you know, with COVID, we were challenged with how do we begin to do outreach with the community? Uh, and so we set up a series of um, uh, various forms of communicating with the community. One was to set up a survey where um, uh, you know, individuals can give us feedback on a survey. We had a list of questions. We also, uh, we were asked to actually do the survey in Spanish and to do the posters in Spanish, the community or Black and Latin X that are at the site. Um, we worked very closely with Madison Park um, Development Corporation in terms of doing the community outreach in person. Can we go next? And this is, you see a photo of us, you know, meeting with, with the community members. It was a very exciting um, uh, uh, meeting. It was fascinating to see so many of the members knowing Marlon since he was a little kid. And so it brings me great pleasure to work with Marlon on this project where the art form itself and the artists is known in the community. And so it would have much more of an impact what was really fascinating was to hear from the community members who, you know, what 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 figures or what history or you know or what places were important for them. So, even if you see the more kind of monumental figures as silhouettes, we plan to um, incorporate some of their feedback on the trails of history, like what what was here before, um, you know, when before like urban development. We hope to bring some of that history and connect the youth with that knowledge. Um, we also held a virtual community meeting. Um, it wasn't as well attended as the in-person. I think it was more important to really be at the place, to be there. Um, also working with some of the elderly population, they couldn't have, they didn't have access to Zoom. So we set up phone call um, kind of meetings and that was directly with Madison, um, uh, Madison Park Development Corporation. And one additional outreach that we plan on doing uh, later in at the end of June or early July is with the youth workforce group. And that's basically to have a workshop with the youth and, you know, and to, um, and to show them some of the design interventions and ideas and to just get their feedback. So most of the feedback was um, the elderly and I would say people ranging from 25 to, you know, to up, but we need to really also go back and talk to the youth, like the 13 year olds and the 17 year olds that are playing ball at, at the site. Next. So these are some of the kind of um, questions that we had on the survey. And we had a really great correspondence, like, you know, how do you visit the Whit playground, you know, is to exercise, to have lunch, um, what public art would you like to see, you know, interactive. I think our approach was really about what public art serves the community versus a one-off, you know, and so that was really kind of uh, what we invested our design uh, vision. Uh, what, what was really fascinating was that they wanted to hear music, so a performance space where they can continue their karaoke, they, they do a lot of karaoke at the site, um, <laughs> And um, they really just want to see children represented. And so that's why it was really important that our, 
our proposals was intergenerational, that it reached to all the different age groups. Next. And then these are some of the significant figures that uh, came from them in terms of the community that lives here. And I was really glad to see even Jean, Jeanine Pinado. I mean, she's a contemporary, um, but obviously has been really impactful to the community. Um, and then you can begin to see that they really wanted to acknowledge like longstanding residents that have been activists in the community. And these are the people that we want to um, make sure that we engrave like, you know, their presence into the park. Next. And in terms of the design project schedule, uh, we're hoping that we can continue with the design development uh, and start getting some bidding for some of these pieces because there are a lot of them. Uh, but you can see that we tried to keep it uh, very simple in terms of the taxonics and construction. And we're hoping that we can produce the construction drawings during the kind of winter and do fabrication early next spring. Next. And I think this is, you know, really detailing where we are in terms of the process. Next. And then our contact information, if any of the public members would like to outreach us, we are very approachable and please feel free to uh, email us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, and Hansi, ama amazing. Uh, one of the things that I think that we've, uh, that kind of, I think slipped with the community meeting was that young people really wanted to be uh, to engage in using the park and utilizing it for games uh, and wanted to utilize it, uh, you know, as soon as possible <laughs> um, for the use of not, not only games, but interactive opportunities. And having the community center, the DeWeet Center so close, I think it's just a, it's a great, it's a great mesh of the two spaces, so. So in terms of wrapping up the presentation, does anyone have questions? What's the next steps? Well, let me step in and just say thank you, um, Clay, for a great presentation. So very detailed, um, so varied. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And I enjoyed sort of your thought process, how you work together to develop these ideas. Uh, we're gonna open the floor to the commissioners uh, for questions or comments that they might want to share with you. And so anyone who is um, interested in speaking, I have a couple of questions, but I'll, I'll wait on those. I see Bob Freeman, you took off your mute. I, I did. Um, I, and I also uh, want to thank uh, Hansi and Marlon for an incredible presentation. Um, I, was, I, was, I was so surprised uh, because this is not your average playground. And I think that's what makes it so inviting uh, for anyone uh, at any age um, to participate in. I did, I did have a couple of questions though. I had one question is that, will there be a basketball court? Um, it, uh, I know the lines might still be there, but I don't know if there, there's the ability to play. Um, and then the other question was um, the, the um, mural, um, not mural, the mirror um, project. And you said that there was glass involved in that. And I was just wondering how um, you might work with the safety of that glass. Um, so uh, if either one of you could answer um, that question, I'd be happy. Marlon, if it's okay, I'll, I can answer both. Um, Stan, Stantec designed already the playground, so there is already a design court um, in place. Oh, and so, <laughs> so it's very colorful. You can, you know, go there. And I think that's why it was really important. We had already, we had a different version of the of the site plan, and it was really great to work with with um, Sarah and Kathy. Um, you know, in the parks and recreation where they said, you have to go visit and, and, and see how your original, the original planning of the project did not work with the new um, playground that exists. So, you know, so yes, there is already a, a ball court there. In terms of um, glass, I think what we, what we were planning on really using is a highly reflective mirror, stainless steel, that almost gives this idea of reflection. Um, if we were to, I have to work with Marlon in terms of the materiality at the end. If we wanted to see through, we could do a very, a, a polycarbonate, um, but we would have to make sure that it doesn't scratch. So we would have to look for a scratch resistant kind of plastic. Um, so it doesn't get, you know, <laughs> um, like harmed uh, or destroyed. 
Thanks, Hansi. Um, I haven't seen you in a while, Rob. It's great to see you, Rob. Hey, it's good to see you too. <laughs> Excellent questions. Thank you so much. A Thanks, any thoughts? Any anything else, Rob? Or any commissioners can chime in and ask questions. I, I have one question um, that crossed my mind. The Madison Park area is also home to some very important African American artists. And I know that asking people about, you know, who are the artists that you know in the area has not yet become as popular as I would like her to be. But John Wilson, who is the author of Eternal Presence and um, Father and Son, grew up in Madison Park and he had some very interesting stories about what it was like during his time. And so I'm wondering if we're talking about the history of the area, might we begin to incorporate artists who are citizens just like everyone else and make contributions? The other artist I'm thinking about is Gary Rickson, who I believe still lives there and is uh, partially responsible for the Black Arts Mural Movement here in Boston. What would that be like to be honoring someone who's even uh, living in the area right now and still living? So just something to think about that we, we tend to leave ourselves out uh, as artists when we're doing history, but we're in there too. So just- that, like, That's fascinating, Aqua. And it, if it's, um, we do you know women artists as well? Because that was really important I'm to gonna make think sure about that, that. Yeah, it was really important, the representation of, of gender as well. Yes, I'm definitely gonna think about that. And I will get back to you with anyone that I come up with. Aqua, we gotta make sure we get you in there, Aqua. <laughs> Am I old enough? <laughs> no, no, I'm just saying you're 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 you know you're phenomenal. So you know, uh, but also you know I, I think that's great, and I think the historical uh, the silhouettes of history that 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 path is a perfect place to kind of insert, and of course you know um, you know I, I was thinking of Paul too as well, right? Um, and the work that you guys have done within the community, so. I'm just kind of following in your footsteps. So thank you guys for your work that you've done over the years. Well, thank you for being such a great representation of what can happen from with someone from Madison Park. I mean, what a, uh, an icon you are. Um, I have one other question too, and then I'll open it up again. This mirror of history, where is that wall exactly? Is that around the court? Um, so, so the mirror of history would be uh, in the middle. Uh, so just going back, I think we can go back some more. Okay, if you could show me the slide, I, I somehow missed it or wasn't paying enough attention. Um, mirror of history, keep going there. Okay. Um, so that's located directly. Um, so if the, like the court, at, so the court's here and then there's a petition in the middle, mm -hmm. that thing. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side of the fence is a kind of raised base that would be a th for theatrical performances okay. and that would be the left of it. And is yeah. there any issue with visibility? Do people wanna make sure that they can see through all the fences? Because I know yeah. they come up in other projects. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, think, I think that's a, that's a great um, idea in terms of having the images, uh, you know, for you to be able to look through them um, and transparent in some way or some components of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's also great for the guys who just play this way, you know, the ball doesn't go into mm. the, the next court. So that's, that's an area I was thinking about that. That would be perfect for that space, understanding that. Right now we're thinking it's appropriate or graded material, but the idea is that it should be transparent to some degree. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I would echo uh, the praise and that one point of concern. Uh, I, I work, do a lot of work on the Madison Park campus with the O'Brien students, and I know that they will love having this nearby and animating that corner of the site, I think is really important. Uh, with the mirror of history, I, I do think it, it, it does bring up some concerns about, um, you know, a, a big wall in the middle of the park. So I, I would look at ways that you can make that more, um, visibly uh, connective rather than dividing the park, um, if that's through, you know, um, perforations or other kinds of means or maybe spacing the panels or whatever it is. I do think that's to me the one area of concern that I would I would raise is um, not not putting a wall that divides the park. 
Co correct. And Mark, um, I think I mentioned this before, there is already an existing fence that partitions those two spaces. Uh, but the, okay. again, the idea was to be graded or perforated. Oh, uh, because they're two ball courts separately. Mm -hmm. uh, now I see. Okay. Yeah, I mean, right now it reads like a large divide mm -hmm. and we're trying yeah. to make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay, got it. So that one was kind of adapting to, and then the other one was a standalone, which was the silhouette. Mm -hmm. I see. Any other thoughts? This is just, it's very textured and very layered. I just uh, really enjoy what you've done and what you've used as inspiration. Um, I, oh, I this... did have a... oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, Aqua. Okay, I was just gonna say one of the things I enjoy about the mirror of history is that it almost looks like a shadow cast by the wall, even though it's not a direct mm. imprint. Mm. It has that feeling of walking through a shadowed area. And I, I think that's really nice. Will that paint be black? Uh, the ground, is that going to be black on asphalt? Or how is that going to be um, rendered? Um, we, we're still, in terms, of, in terms of the color, we yeah. are still working on. But we have, we're looking at monochrome. So uh, you know, scales of gray, yeah? yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that one I'll leave to Marlon. Yeah, this is great. Yeah. Uh, I had one question on the on the walk with the cutouts of the figures. Are they life size or are they larger than life size? Is there some? Uh, I love the idea and the fact that you can sort of place yourself in them is really amazing and complete them in some ways. But I wasn't sure you if you mentioned that they were. You said seven feet tall or something. Is that the frame or is the figure? I think Reggie enlarged? Lewis, isn't he seven feet tall? <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea was to actually map their height. Okay, good. I think that's nice that there's a kind of, you can really sense how big these people were. Yeah, Reggie's six, six. Or how small. Six, or how six. small, yeah. <laughs> like Miss Lewis, he's like five feet, so. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, along those lines, the, the actual panels will be the same size, but the figures indented in them will be different sizes. Mm -hmm. uh, is that how it is? You think that the figures inside will be, uh, we're going to try to make sure that the figures are as close to actual size. Yeah, but each panel, each standing piece will be the same size? Um, no. Okay. There's an image of the elevations. Yeah, you can go back to that slide yeah. as well. There. Mm -hmm. do, you have a, do you have a sense of what kind of materials you're thinking for these panels? With public art, I love steel. Yeah, it's just, just a consideration of like sharp edges. You know, if, if yeah. somebody has the option of literally kind of placing themselves within the piece, which I actually, that's like kind of really a beautiful moment um, and user experience of the piece, but just making sure that, you know. To round the um, edges. Mm -hmm. They're soft and kind of welcoming in that regard. It's a great photo op, uh, great selfie opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts, commissioners, questions? All right, then why don't I open it up to um, our guest today. Um, if you recall, you can either put a question in the chat or you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. And Sarah will let us know if there's anyone waiting. Um, I also noticed that um, our partner, Kathy Baker Clips from the Parks Department is here. Um, Kathy, if you have anything you'd like to share, please also feel free. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm just here listening and, and uh, supportive of the project. I think um, what we've seen is that the park is really well used and really, really well received, and this is just going to make it uh, even more important to the community. So we're excited to see this move forward. Thank you, Kathy. I just, just want to say, um, Thank you, Kathy, for your patience and all of your support with this. I uh, neglected to say that in my introduction. I so appreciate your being here and um, what an incredible partner you've been um, to our office, to the artists, um, as we've moved this forward. Thank you so much. 
Sarah, we should probably give you a big thank you and shout out as well, because I know you've worked quite a bit on this project and that you care about it. Uh, so yes, round of applause for you. Go oh, Sarah. <laughs> All right, any hands up, Sarah? Do, uh, do we have anyone out there that like would like to? Um, I don't see hands up, but I have to say this team makes it very easy. They, you know, they make me look good, so. <laughs> Great. Well, can I just no. clarify something with Karen? So we're this is preliminary or yep. Pre yep. preliminary review. Okay, great. Do we want to make a motion? So do yes, I, uh, go ahead. Mark. Do you want to? No, Mark, you uh, should make the motion. Okay, I move that we give preliminary approval to. Uh, can we insert the name of the? the the play, play team's um, uh, proposal as presented at today's session. Thank you. I would second that. So um, motion made and seconded. So um, let's go through a roll call. If I call your name and you're in support, you know what to say. So I'll start with you, Brian. Yes. John. Yes. Bob. Yes. Camilo. Yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, Kim, I think, did she step away? I think she did. Um, Mark. Yes. And I'm a yes also. So that would mean that the motion passes and the preliminary designs from the play team have been accepted. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Marlon and Hansi. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank Great you work. Great condition. work. Yeah, very exciting. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much, yes, yes. So I'm kicking it back to... Oh yes, it's back to me now. Mm -hmm. um, so our next project for review is Deep Time Stories for Jamaica Playing. This review will be an advisory review, review as the project has not come before us for some time. Sarah Rodrigo will again give brief background and introduce the artists. Sarah? Thank you, Commissioner Pasnick. Um, so this project was, was a capital project uh, initiated by the Department of Public Works, who also provided the initial funding for the artwork. This project predates the Percent for Art uh, program. Uh, extensive, this was an extensive renovation of the Hyde Square Rotary to create a safer rotary and a more pleasant experience for all the residents using any mode of transport. And I think I saw Zach Wasmapier from Public Works, and I want to thank him for his incredible patience and support through this process. Um, this project, I believe, started in 2016. Uh, for the, the project, which predates me, our office partnered with several local organizations, in particular Hyde Square Task Force and Three Squares Main Streets, who have continued to support and partner with us on this project. I think I also saw uh, Ken Tangvik uh, with Hyde Square Task Force here and Rich Peretz, who is with Three Squares Main Street. So thank you to both of them as well. Um, and we're really appreciating all this continued support that we're getting from these partners. So as I've mentioned a few times now, it's taken several years to work through various contracting, engineering, funding, and other hurdles since the RS received their preliminary design approval for this project, which is um, in a traffic rotary. It has a lot of engineering and uh, practical concerns that need to be worked through. Um, so we thought that it'd be best to bring the artists in for an advisory review before they finalize their design to get some input from the commission and familiarize them once again with both their work and with what they're proposing for the square. Um, so I will introduce <laughs> the artist and Christina will share some of her other public work to help give some context to this proposal. Christina Pereño Alonso is an architect, designer and educator at the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT, where her research transtectonics explores cultural and environmental implications of expanded temporal sensibilities in architectural material practice. Her tectonic translations, material transfers across mediums and temporal scales, human and more than human, 
embody narratives that are told in the form of essays, exhibitions, and through architectural projects and installations that activate public spaces. Amin Taj received his master's degree in architecture from the University of Tehran. He co-founded VAV Studio, feel free to correct me on that, <laughs> um, in uh, Iran in 2003, through which he has designed and executed numerous public and private projects. His projects have earned him several national and international awards and recognition and have been showcased in several exhibitions, including Venice Biennale 2016 and Seoul Biennale of Architecture and Urbanism in 2017. In 2011, he was invited to MIT as a Victor Scholar, where he met Christina and started his collaboration with her on several architectural and art projects and competitions. He's now a senior associate at NADAAA, NADA. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. An award-winning Boston-based Boston -based architectural firm. Since joining NADA, he has been working as the designer and project manager on several public and community-driven projects, including the Adams Street branch of the Boston Public Library in Dorchester, the Marble Block Art Center in Biddeford, Maine, and the development of Fordham Landing in the Bronx. Christina, I mean, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, so much. Thank you to the Boston Art Commission as well for this opportunity to share the work with you guys. It's really nice to be here and see all these uh, familiar faces. And um, I mean, and I am really excited to be sharing the work with you. Um, so as Sarah was saying, uh, we have a few slides uh, before the, the project uh, uh, about previous work. And I would, would say, Sarah, that we can go fairly fast, like under one after the other, just it, it was uh, the idea to give a sense of maybe you can go to the next. Uh, it was the idea and next, like kind of while I talk, like kind of pass by the idea to give a little bit of a sense of um, our interest on uh, material exploration. These are all part of Transtectonics, the uh, research that Sarah was mentioning at MIT that all, although it's an architectural research on, on materials, the, the pieces have a very strong sculptural uh, component. And we thought, and, and that um, sense uh, of materiality is something that we want to bring also to, to, to high Square. So we thought it would be interesting uh, for us to, to show that, no? like kind of the idea of materials um, as a way to explore perhaps non-conventional ways uh, of working with a stone or working with wood um, and as a way of exploring ideas, as a way of engaging with the, with the public. This, this uh, you can go to the next. This one, so what you just saw before was Transtectonics, uh, which was exhibited in Art Omi, in the Keller Gallery. It was exhibited in, in Venice, um, in, in this Venice that has a uh, Biennale that has just been uh, inaugurated. And this project is Carbon to Rock. It's another um, uh, project that is exhibited in the Biennale uh, of Architecture in, in Venice. And it does talk about, uh, again, ideas that we would like to bring to, to Hyde Square. One of them has to do, um, again, with materi materiality. The ma here, in this case, is the material of uh, volcanic rock. And then the idea of time. Um, and this project brings the idea of, of time because it's, uh, it, it exhibits um, new technologies that uh, uh, are exploring ways for uh, volcanic rock to absorb CO2, or more than to absorb CO2, because volcanic rock always absorbs CO2, but the process takes millions of years. But in this case, these technologies have shortened that span to a two-year period. and so. We are very interested in this idea of bridging geological timescales with human timescales. And, and that's, uh, uh, these, these are some images of the, of the texture, textures of the, of the rock over the um, um, architecture of, of Venice. But it's really, um, obviously, Beautiful. together with, with the materiality, it's, it's all about this, uh, these ideas of, of time and, and planetary issues. And so, um, yeah, you, you can. Next, this, this, the, it's a, pro, a project that we were very hands-on uh, from the um, rock hunting in the volcano of Villarrica to the making of the piece here in the south of Spain uh, in the factory of Cuellar Stone. 
And then the next one, uh, the, the, the installation in, in Venice where the piece came already made and, and it was uh, uh, done in a few hours. Next one. Next one. Next. These are some uh, projects, uh, in, or this is particularly the, this one in uh, for the Boston uh, Design uh, Biennial in 2015 uh, in the Rose Kennedy Park, also working with materials uh, in non-conventional ways. This is in the International Design Center in Cambridge uh, in MIT. Um, and again, the idea always about the, the sculptural capacities that, that these materials uh, embody just Ugh. by virtue of the way the light uh, uh, is reflected and, and so on. And then again, uh, together with ideas of uh, uh, structure and, and architectural uh, um, thoughts in terms of material experimentation. Next. Um, so this, this is um, the project in Hyde Square, and I'm going to start, I don't know if the next one is, uh, can you go to the next one, Sarah? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to start with this image because it's the one that you know, or you have seen before, uh, a few, last time that we presented to the BSC, um, and the project since then has evolved in ways that we are very excited, but, uh, but here are some ideas that we are maintaining because we thought were important and one, uh, and because they were welcomed by the community and also by this uh, committee. And so one of these ideas was that the artwork was not going to be one piece, but was going to be a series of interventions as a way to create urban identity to this square. Uh, that otherwise it feels very much like a roundabout and it was the idea to, to create like kind of more than one intervention. And the other idea was uh, to work with a material that would bring some uh, level of, of transparency and reflection of light. Uh, the idea that the, uh, depending on where the sun would be during the day, the, the reflection of these uh, sculptures uh, would change and it would register some, some how the, the, the passing of time. Um, and so next. Yeah, so uh, since then, again, the project has evolved uh, in, in ways that we are excited by uh, enlarging the notion uh, of time. Um, these are the three locations where the, the pieces are going to be, uh, are now, we propose them now, we, obviously, um, we think like kind of we are open to, to suggestions, although these are like kind of the, the final um, decisions that we have arrived to. Next, uh, this is one of the of the three pieces, perhaps the one that resembles more uh, the original configuration, where a series of vertical thirty uh, uh, feet tall transparent poles are meant to produce this series of reflections or and refractions of light uh, in the square. Next one. And so the, 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 this installation, Deep Time Stories of Jamaica Plain, uh, the, the name is another one of the things that has changed, is an urban storytelling device. This is another thing that we have introduced, like that kind of the idea of a storytelling. And what we have done is expanding the notion of time and using time as an enabler uh, of the stories of the people that live here in Jamaica Plain and that have lived here in the past. And we are also incorporating the notion of deep time, which is the multimillion time frame uh, within which multimillion year time frame within which the earth has existed. In a way, acknowledging that we'd like to give no um, voice to the stories of humans here, but also the stories of the planet, right? The stories of, of this side way beyond uh, humans. And so we have developed these three artifacts for the site that correspond to three important areas in the, in the square. And each of these artifacts is a different material combination that becomes a different medium for a storytelling. And what each of these artifacts have in common is that they enable, they enable the layering of stories at the human time scale and material narratives at a, a geological time scale. Um, and so in this uh, uh, installation, um, 
the, the, the word permanent, you can go to the next one, the next slide. The, the, the word permanent uh, acquires a, a new dimension. And here permanent installation uh, relies on two types of, let's say, immortal materials. And we have the old immortals, fossils and rocks, which are the recordings of the geological stories of this place that I was mentioning. And we have the new immortals and amongst them plastic uh, and plastic glomerate rock, which will bear uh, material narratives that will outlast any human generation or civilization. And so the driving force of this project was developed uh, through multiple community meetings uh, with a Hyde Square Task Force. And it all became really about celebrating the history and the identity of the, of the place. And we became very interested in the notion of what constitutes uh, history, right? Who decides the stories that make it to history and who are the subjects and the tellers of uh, those stories. Next one. Um, and so for us, history in this uh, project is understood as a conglomerate of stories across times and subjects. Among many, many, many other stories, we have the stories of the Irish and the Germans that came uh, in the early eight, 1800s, uh, the stories brought by immigrants from South America in the 60s, the rerouting of the Muddy River, uh, which changed the physical boundary of the neighborhood in 1860s, the stories of Kuchamaiken, who was the chief of one of the tribes at Jamaica Pond and who gave the name to Jamaica Plain. And it's about the geological narratives of this land prior to the appearance of humans. Jamaica Plain is encroached in a geological formation made of Paddingstone, otherwise known as Roxbury Conglomerate. And so it's about the stories of the Coleman Quarry, which for years uh, was the source of this padding stone and which was filled and permanently closed in the 60s, costing numerous job losses, and, and which later became, became the Kevin Fitzgerald Park. And then, of course, uh, as I was mentioning, it's uh, about uh, the stories of each and every one, human and more than human, that lives and uh, has lived in Jamaica Plain and is part of this community. And so the, the project is really about discovering uh, the history of the site by, by revealing the, the stories of the various subjects that it harbors. And so now I'm going to explain uh, slightly uh, each of these uh, characters, uh, future fossil. Uh, the first, uh, this is uh, the first artifact that is an earth casting piece. And so basically each of uh, the three um, objects or the three artifacts and three characters have a combination of uh, a new and an old uh, uh, immortal. And so the idea of the um, acrylic tubes and the idea of the transparency uh, stays always part of the, of the project, but then there is like always a new material that enters the, the project in this case. Um, the casting piece is meant to transmit stories at both human and geological timescales, as I, I was mentioning, at the human time scale through oral stories of the community and at the geological timescale through a series of fossils from this area uh, that are cast in place, bringing geological narratives to the piece. And so the specific content and the way the oral histories uh, are shared uh, we would like to develop it in collaboration with community, I mean, groups like, for example, a story club in Boston, which is an organization based in, in Jamaica Plain. Next. The second artifact is called Story Rock. Uh, and here the material is one of the first canvases that humans ever use for writing, stone. A conglomerate of stories of this place will be carved in this, uh, in a big Roxbury conglomerate, a stone, a stone that has been in Jamaica Plain for the past 600 million years, a stone that has uh, made the foundations of every house in Jamaica Plain, a stone, that, a stone that bears its own narratives, while at the same time will serve as a platform to tell the stories from the first inhabitants uh, of Jamaica Plain until those that live here today. And finally, next slide, please. Uh, new Immortals is a message to the future. The material uh, of the whole base here is plastic glomerate. Plastic glomerate is a new type of rock announced in 2014 by the Geological Society of America, who defines it as a multi-composite material made hard by agglutination of rock and molten plastic. 
and it, is, it has started to occur, occur naturally in the meeting of magma and human settlement. So here, plastic conglomerate becomes an emblem of the imbrication of human and geological processes. It's a sort of a, a new immortal that will enable us to communicate with the generations of the deep future. And the, here, the human time scale it come from a, will come from a collection, a collection of artifacts donated by people from this community, artifacts that relate to their own stories and to the concerns of our civilization about climate change and to be shared with the future. Uh, next one. Um, and so here, um, this um, prototype, this uh, character, New Immortals, has a, a huge component of material experimentation in the making of this plastic conglomerate, or the parts of it will be made with this material. And for that, we will collaborate with Syrac uh, Syracuse University, with the Lava Lab, um, working on some material experimentation, as I was mentioned, that, that we are interested. I, and then last slide, uh, Sarah, next one. This is some of the textures of this, uh, of this new uh, type of uh, rock that we would like to, to develop. Um, so with that, I will open to questions and suggestions. Thank you, Christina. Um, very fascinating, which is uh, something that, that I'm used to whenever you're talking. Uh, so thank you for sharing these stories uh, and this very nuanced and layered uh, piece. I, I do have one question before we open up to the commissioners. Could you just go back to the site plan and, and tell us which one is which? And Christina, you seem to be muted. So, okay, Thank you. there we go. Okay, so um, the the one uh, I, I don't think you see my pointer right here. No. So the one to the yeah, that one is uh, um, it's new immortals, and that's the one that will be made with plastic glomerate. Is the one that has the three larger tubes. The one to the right, that, that one is future fossil. And it will be the one where um, we'll have more to do with oral stories. It is slightly shorter. And the other one is the, is the one that resembles more the, the world that you had seen before, a story row, which, uh, which has the plastic tubes that are uh, tall. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd like to open it up to other commissioners who might have questions or comments. Maybe you could uh, clarify. So the, the piece on the far left are plastic tubes. The piece in the middle are glass tubes. And the piece oh. on the right are metal tubes, or maybe you can clarify what, or yeah. help me understand what each of the tubes are. Of course, of course. All, all the tubes are made of the same material, which is the idea, is where the idea of the new immortal comes, which is plastic, will be acrylic and will, and will give this sense of uh, transparency, is what I was, is, is what relates more to the previous uh, project that we presented in this, uh, to this committee. Um, and, and the idea was how the, um, we, we are also, by the way, these uh, images are in black and white, the notion of color, um, it's still in our minds, it's perhaps something subtle that can work with the light of, uh, uh, of the sun, but all of them are made with the same material, the tubes. In all of them, or at least in the two first ones, and we will need to have uh, at least three tubes made of uh, steel for structural reasons. In the first one, because the tubes on their own uh, will need some support, so they will be tied to the, in fact, the first one, uh, Story Rock, the one with the 30 feet uh, tall uh, tubes, 
which is the most challenging structurally, is the one that is structurally calculated already. So we already have the engineers, engineers on board and that one is already signed with these uh, three poles with, that are made of, of steel. Um, and then the, the, the rest are all transparent. Thank you. Other questions from commissioners or comments? Yeah, I, I have a question. So I'm looking at this slide now, deep time stories of Jamaica Plain. Is this what each piece will actually look like? I, I know the one that looks similar to the original or an earlier version. This one in the middle, what is that material at the top of the tubes? So that, that material will be uh, some sort of earth casting made uh, uh, type of uh, material. We are still, we, we want it all to relate with the idea of rock or air, but definitely we need to, uh, the piece that is above will need to be something lighter in order to be supported. And obviously there will be three tubes that are made with, uh, that, that will be still supporting this, this space. And the idea is to create a space where someone can see and be in the shade. The piece will have holes so the light can come through the through these tubes, and so this is this piece is called um, the human time scale of this piece comes from the stories told uh, orally, so it's oral stories, and that's why we wanted to create a space that was more to for two people to sit, for example, and 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 discuss. And then the third piece um, are those larger tubes. They are larger tubes. They are like um, uh, 45 centimeter uh, diameter. 20 inches. 20 inches. 20 inches, okay. And is that also including some seating area? It's really hard to tell on my computer. Yeah, everything's so yes, small. yes, yes, yes. There, there will be, but it will not, there will be like kind of a seating area for one or two people, but it's not, um, uh, it's not covered in this case. So all of them have, and also in the first one, uh, the first one is story rock, which is supposed to be a rock. The idea is that one can see it as well. I mean, the difference, I guess, the main difference is that in the one in the middle, we also provide shade. So just again, as a kind of a clarification on the meaning of seating a space, we are not designing a chair or something like this here. It is a piece of rock that almost is a height that you can't see it, but it's like kind of when you sit on a rock in the mountains. So it's not something that is officially sitting a space, but we want to see all of those interaction between people and art piece that we are creating here. Yes. And the way that the body is somehow is part of that space. It's, sort of an, it's an invitation, but it's yes. not a chair. Not a chair, it's a piece in the end. It is okay. kind of, is a rock, mm -hmm. but definitely we are designing the heights in the way that is comfortable for somebody to sit without thinking that they are sitting on the chair or on the bench. Christina and Amin, thank you for presenting this work to us. This is the first time I've seen it. I'm new to the commission. I'm, I'm curious about this idea of geologic time connected to human time and how you both have thought about, let's say a resident of Jamaica Plain coming upon your sculpture as they're walking. And this is obviously deeply researched and deeply thought through um, both conceptually and through the materials. And how does that reveal itself to a person who's passing along? Will there be a placard? Will there be some description of these details, um, these conceptions and this geologic history that you've included? This obviously is a piece of public art, unlike at the architecture biennial. And whereas that offers the opportunity for a catalog and greater explication, what educational materials or ways to mark how you're thinking about this project will be available to the general public? Uh, so again, as you said, this is a, a public art piece. So 
uh, as usual of the public art pieces, there won't be any kind of full brush brochure attached to that. And always there are some part of the story written somewhere else. So you see a lot of these pieces in the city, even a, a very realistic of them. And you have to go again and read who are those people. So there is nothing there that say, okay, this is King Arthur and this is, for example, Queen Elizabeth. So I'm just making names. So there are always these layers of uh, information that won't be attached to it. The question is how people are gonna interact with this piece regardless of uh, all of these thoughts that we have about different layers of that. Uh, as Christina was saying, the notion of the time and the permanent art piece was the core to our discussion, how we can expand this thing to the larger time period and the kind of larger storytelling thing. And to the extent that public uh, can somehow be involved in this kind of art piece, I think this is clear. At least we think that this is clear. You see the notion of the time, you see the notion of the larger scale of the time through all of those materiality of the pieces. And you see the, for example, the notion of the seconds and hours through the reflection and refraction that you see by, for example, that when you are passing in the morning, morning you see different kind of way of interaction between light and those transparent poles. And that gives another layer of the time to the project. So as far as understanding that the project is about the time, I think uh, we think that it is clear. As far as understanding that the time has different uh, scales each piece has a very clear uh, kind of uh, connection to the uh, scale of the time from a human scale to a geologi geological larger scale of a uh, million years. And if it needs more information outside of the uh, site of the art installation, definitely. And if the text somewhere else can be a kind of complementary, absolutely. I mean, I, I guess that the, for us it's important that the three pieces work um, as, as a public art work, regardless the these layers that for us are very important. But then there is like kind of a, a these layers of, of time bring also like kind of a way of engaging with the community that we think could be very interesting. So all these stories that we would like uh, the community to to tell us and record in the in the rock and so there will be engravings or carvings uh, in this in this rock so I guess that the, you were asking uh, uh, about the person that comes and doesn't know anything about the project right I, that there's also the, the person that comes and sees himself or herself part of the of the artwork because uh, part of the stories uh, uh, told are, are somehow uh, uh, made the made the work. Um, so I think that, that that's a very important question, and um, yeah, we would love to to hear thoughts and, and uh, are open to suggestions. John, uh, John, do you want to add to that in response? Still mulling it over. Equa, you go. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I know this area and it's very, very busy. It's a rotary, there's a monument in the middle in that circle there. And I, I feel like looking at these drawings, it's almost as if the sculpture is out in some, you know, fields with no people and no cars. And um, I'm curious to how this can work with them being in separate spaces, how people will see an integration of this, I, these ideas that you're putting forth and whether or not your, maybe your next presentation could have a more representational um, view of how this will actually look in the space where you're proposing it. I mean, even the colors that you use, it's kind of like a washed out background, but it's, it's Hyde Square. So it's bricks and concrete and trees and colors and signage and all of that kind of stuff. And so, um, 
you know, one thing I've learned is like looking at a, a drawing is one thing, but looking at an actual installed piece of public art is something completely different. And so I'm wondering as we get down the road, if you could share this in a more representational space for us to view, at least that would be helpful for me. I would kind of follow up with that too. I can, some of my, my questions are kind of about the site um, and just wondering you know, how, how accessible are these pieces to you know, an individual who is on foot, for example, um, which it's a little hard to kind of tell that in the drawings, but um, you know, it looks like a busy site. So there, it looks like there's a lot of auto traffic in the area. Um, and if the pieces are you know, extending that invitation for someone to interact with the piece, um, just making sure that that's kind of being done in a smart way, um, realizing the kind of full realities of the site. And then similarly for, I think one of my questions was for uh, the piece entitled Story Rock, I think, um, if, it, if the pieces are kind of inviting somebody to interact with them, that one does kind of invite, I think, someone to almost climb it. Um, you know, it kind of has a ladder-esque feeling to it um, and just kind of being aware of that um, and recognizing that with a public art piece like this, um, individuals will utilize it in many different ways. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so just to answer both, because I, they are both related, right? Like I'm related to the site, like why I think you are totally right. Um, the site is like kind of a site on a deep future. And so really these representations are speaking more about like kind of the, the, this kind of dreaming narrative and perhaps less, um, less about the, the today, right, of the site. We have many, I mean, this project also per, perhaps uh, we just tested this as a way to uh, deepen uh, the ideas behind, behind the project just because we have so many renderings uh, with the poles that are transparent in the side with all the people and maybe like I know perhaps we should have uh, brought like kind of some of those from the past and what we can do is update these ones for future presentations. In terms of the location of these pieces and how they um, the public will engage with them, they are placed also that hasn't changed from last time we presented uh, uh, to, to this committee. There is one piece less, uh, but the, the, the other three that remain are located in the areas where the sidewalks were expanded and extended uh, so that there is a little bit of uh, breathing space for people to engage. Um, this piece, I, I, I mean, I don't, I, don't know, I don't see how someone would be able to um, climb the, like kind of the ties of uh, that connect the um, the tubes with the the plastic tubes with the steel tubes, like kind of will happen uh, high enough so that not, no one can reach them, um, and I, I think it would be <laughs> quite. I don't think it will be inviting for for climbing. So hopefully that's not that will not be a problem. Thank you. Other comments, John? Did you want to come back to your thought, or you you need a longer time to consider that? I think in thinking through this, I would just ask, sort of beyond the conceptual nature of the work and the materiality, to think through how you engage with the work even beyond those ideas that you've put together, which again, may not be apparent to a person just happening upon this. So what is that experience if they see this material, if they engage with this piece? You spoke briefly about some engravings that'll happen and working with um, storytellers in Jamaica Plain. And while you've only touched on that, you haven't sort of provided a larger explanation of how that work with the community then gets incorporated to the work so that this geologic time is connected to the human time in which we're currently living. And I think that would be one, helpful for me to hear and two, benefit that sort of general interest of people who happen upon these pieces. 
That's very well put. And I, I would agree that I think some level of interpretation, but it's really up to you as artists to determine what that level is and what story you want to tell. I do think that there is the you know, strange artifact that you discover that you know nothing about version of it, um, which is maybe a little bit what you're describing here, that there is no interpretation, but there could also be some level of uh, poet poetic words or other things that signal some knowledge that could be shared about it. So I, I think it's really, a, I would agree with this question is the interpretation of these, you, you've given us a pretty fascinating story, it'd be said to sort of lose that entirely um, in the piece itself. And I, I'm not convinced yet that it communicates it fully through just its form. Um, and then the second comment I sort of heard today, uh, and again, this is an advisory meeting, so we're, we're offering some advice and thoughts for, for future. Um, I'll open it up to other commissioners, but just one more was the positioning and the way it sits in the actual fabric itself and sort of understanding that because I see them as potentially really sublime elements in the city that are kind of strange um, and unexpected, let's say. Uh, and I don't want that to be, you know, destroyed by proximity to bike racks and um, street signage and uh, fire hydrants and all of that kind of stuff. So I think it is somewhat dependent on understanding the detail of its position in the city and how it maintains its, you know, its, um, its fascinating, uh, unusual character, you know, this, this sort of inverted rock floating in the sky and those kinds of things. I think they, that sublime character, um, I just like to see how that plays out in the actual fabric of the city. Are there other Can I add something about that uh, uh, part of the so uh, the, another interesting or the interesting thing about JP is that you would see accidentally in one narrow street a piece of rock that comes out of the ground in front of somebody's house. So these kind of uh, geological uh, pieces is somehow is part of the context of that neighborhood somehow seeing these rocks, seeing these kind of elements of the nature that comes out of the fabric of the urban spaces. So even though that it is alien to a common mind of seeing the city, but it is kind of common to the nature of that neighborhood. It's very similar to what, for example, a New York can think about Boston and seeing a Turkey in the middle of uh, town. It's common for us, but the other day I had a New Yorkian here and we were seeing this beautiful turkey passing in front of our house and they were amused of what, what, what is happening in this city. So to some extent, again, uh, we were trying to be uh, related to that context and Taking that language of rock was something that we borrowed from JP somehow. Mm -hmm. And I think the suggestion that I'm making or that others are making is to uh, sort of prove that it works in that context um, by understanding more specifically the way it, it sits there. So I think in the next round, it would be good to really see how far away is it from the street wall? How Close is it to the curb? Um, what other, you know, pieces of the street furniture are very close to it or not close to it? Those would just all be things that we'd want to see. So it maintains this um, this presence that you're envisioning, which I think is pretty fas fascinating. Other commissioner comments or recommendations? Again, this is advisory, so it's a chance to weigh in if you have any points to make. Are there any project partners on the call, Christina or, uh, or Sarah? Do you wanna introduce any project partners who might say a word? Well, um, if they'd like to speak, I think that Zach uh, may still be here and I see Ken is still here. Um, sure, Ken, go ahead, if you'd like. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, so I'm with uh, the High Square Task Force, and you know we've been part of this project for many years now, and I we really appreciate the perseverance of the artist, and also how they've taken the time to really, you know, go deep into our community's history and be aware of, you know, from knowing the local business owners to knowing, you know, you made me think of the home I own in Jamaica Plain and I, I yeah, the, the rocks in the basement that are holding it all up and all my neighbors uh, as well. But um, another reason why we think this is a really cool thing is because, as you know, the Mayor's uh, Office of Arts and Culture worked with us to get this neighborhood uh, designated as a cultural district. And that rotary is um, one of the entrances to the cultural district. So it will be a rather dramatic entry into Boston's Latin Quarter um, that we're excited about. And so, um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, we're committed to bringing youth uh, both into the process and, you know, once it's there to to uh, educate our youth, um, you know, on a regular basis, what this project means, and and to take our youth there and um, and talk about this is the entry, it's it's the entrance of the cultural district that you all, some of your predecessors, the youth, uh, pushed to have. Um, so um, you know, we're excited to continue working on this. I learned a lot listening to people's comments. I, I, I learned a lot just seeing this presentation a second time um, and, and I greatly appreciate it. Well, thank you for supporting this project as well. It's great to have something new coming uh, for this place. Um, I'd open it up to any uh, public comments now. Um, Chair Pesnik, I think Zach uh, is Oh, also like to wanted say to say words. something. Okay, sorry, Zach. Hi. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say. Uh, this is I'm Zach Wasmuth with the uh, Boston Public Works Department. I was the project manager for the Hyde Square um, redesign with the with the roundabout and everything. And you know, we've always you know envisioned uh, having a public art piece out here as part of the design. And you know, we've been working off and on with uh, Christina and Emin uh, for year for years now. Uh, talking about this project. So it's very, very exciting to see this developing to this level. And, uh, you know, I'm very interested to the to the new, um, the new thing and concepts and ideas that have been presented here tonight. And, uh, and yeah, I just want to say that obviously public works ha has always been but is, is very supportive of the uh, of artwork in this in this location, we really see this as a, um, as a as a real benefit and a good synergy with the with the work that we've done out here already. Great, thanks. And also a personal thanks for fixing that circle. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> chair, um, I'd also like to read a comment from Rich Peretz, who is the chair okay. of the Three Squares Design Committee. He's on a computer that uh, where he can't give his comment himself, but he great. sent me a chat um, that said that he fully supports this wonderfully innovative sculpture that will enhance Hyde Square incredibly. So thank you, Rich, for that. Great. Uh, are there any comments from the public? Has anybody raised their hand? No, seeing none. Not yet. OK, we'll give it one more minute. Actually, maybe while we're waiting, uh, do we have any uh, larger schedule uh, well, Mark, for this Mark. project? In Mark, I wanted to add a, a comment. I think okay. when the team comes back, It'd be helpful because uh, I've just listened to, to Ken's comment about how this is a, a gateway. To be, I, I think it would be helpful to have images of all three approaches into the square, so we can see uh, the different perspectives and see how each how these this piece. Because I'm I'm seeing the, even though they're three separate pieces, but as one sort of piece, how um, approaching the square from the three different or maybe even four different uh, locations, how the, the piece uh, appears. Because I, I know you're gonna have a different experience and a different view from each of the three or four um, approaches. Okay. Sarah, uh, any hands raised? I'm not seeing any hands okay. raised. 
And my, my question is maybe more about the next steps for the, the artists have received some feedback from us. Um, Christina, do you have a plan of when you might come back to us? Um, or is that a little hard to tell? <laughs> no, pretty soon. I mean, I, we would like to move this uh, very, very fast. So we would like to um, address uh, these issues that you've mentioned as soon as possible. I think a lot has to do with, uh, I mean, all of them, all of them are, are important and then come back uh, as soon as you let us, I guess. <laughs> okay, so work with Sarah on setting up mm -hmm. an, another date for, mm -hmm. and, and I assume that that would be then a preliminary approval or how would we the next uh, that'd be will final, be final approval. design approval, oh, and they'll be able okay, to Okay, because it to this has already gone through preliminary. Okay, got it. I think we're all very excited to see this project move into fabrication. <laughs> Christina yes. and Amin have put in a lot of time. Yes, um, I agree. And some very beautiful ideas and work presented today. So thank you very much. Uh, if there are no uh, comments from the public, then we we don't have any action as a commission on this because it's uh, advisory. So we can move to our final item of business, which is uh, to adjourn. So first I'll say though, we look forward to um, uh, Christina and uh, Amin to seeing next steps with you and to uh, ushering this towards the finish line. It has been a long process, I know for you. and We appreciate how much you've committed to it. Um, so thank you for coming in today. And we appreciate your comments, really, very, very helpful. And thank you all. Thank you. Great. So uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, so Bob has moved. Uh, is there a second? Second. second. Uh, I heard Brian louder, so <laughs> <laughs> we'll give that to Brian. And uh, I will read off the roll call. Uh, please say I or yes. Um, Aqua. Yes. Camillo, I believe had to step out. Uh, John. Yes. Michael. Yes. Uh, Bob. Yes. Uh, Brian. Yes. And I am a yes as well. So the motion passes. We are officially adjourned. Thank you to everybody. Uh, and greetings from New York City. Uh, so uh, I hope everybody uh, heats the heat in the next few hours the way we just did here. Send it on up. I, yep, the storms are <laughs> coming. <laughs> okay, take care of everybody. Thanks everyone.